A man clad in a straw hat and round glasses, dangling from the hands of a large clock, stories above the sidewalk. It's an iconic sequence that has been synonymous with film comedy for close to a century now. If you're a casual movie fan, you've probably at least seen this image once in your life, even if represented in homage or parody, a testament to its impact on generations of filmmakers. To the more serious comedy fan, this sequence is only the tip of the iceberg that is Harold Lloyd. Just as beloved as Chaplin, and just as daring as Keaton, Lloyd was considered to be one of the most influential and prolific film stars of his era. In his films, he commonly represented the everyman, a down-on-his-luck simpleton with big dreams and an even bigger heart. He starred in over 200 short and feature films between 1914 and 1947, but unlike many of his peers, Lloyd also embraced the advent of sound and film head-on, continuing to use this new medium to evolve his act. Good evening, sir. Are you a member? Oh, uh, son, have you seen Charlie? Charlie? Yes. Who is Charlie? What, you don't know Charlie? No, sir. Well, he walks like this. His work is often overlooked today, a result of him keeping tight control on the copyright of his films after he retired. While the movies of Keaton and Chaplin were being rediscovered by new movie fans through TV and syndication, Lloyd was charging $300,000 per movie for TV airings, a request that was often unmet by the networks. Well. And so, his films, which were once hailed as some of the best of the silent era, went unnoticed for generations. It wasn't until his death in the 70s that his movies began to be seen all over the world once more. Today, his films are more available than ever, and I wanted to make a video to explore his talent and encourage those unfamiliar to check out the work of Harold Lloyd, film's first underdog. Unlike many of the great silent comedians of the era, Lloyd did not come into show business through years of training in vaudeville and on the stage. Instead, his interests always lie directly with the film industry, falling in love with movies after working at a movie theater at a young age. He yearned to be a serious dramatic actor, so much so that at age 20 he moved to Los Angeles to pursue a career in acting, starting out as an extra in silent film comedies. It was while working as an extra that Lloyd befriended Hal Roach, who was also working as an extra. Roach, who would later come to be known for producing the Little Rascals shorts and Laurel and Hardy comedies, came into an inheritance in 1915 and decided to start his own studio. Harold Lloyd was one of the first performers he recruited for this new venture. While Harold had no prior training in comedy, he was a natural in the genre mainly due to the fact that he was such a huge fan of comedy movies himself. Roach and Lloyd developed a character called Lonesome Luke, a character inspired by Chaplin's The Tramp, who Lloyd greatly admired. Lloyd made subtle changes to differ himself from Chaplin though, wearing a mustache that was split in the middle and undersized clothes versus Chaplin's oversized. Despite being a knockoff, the Lonesome Luke comedies were incredibly successful in their own right. While they brought Lloyd more fame and recognition, he felt the character limited the comedy and emotional depth he could achieve in his movies, and more importantly, that the character lacked a real identity. I was never particularly happy with, uh, with Lonesome Luke, but he was a fine stepping stone. I did him for years. Lonesome Luke was, uh, was quite popular at the time, making money for him. Uh, they don't like to change a character when it's making money for him. But uh, it was not a, a good character. He was an imitation type of character as far as I was concerned. Lloyd abandoned the Lonesome Luke character in favor of a persona he felt more fitted to play, himself. Unlike Luke, the Harold Lloyd character, who Lloyd referred to simply as the boy, was an everyman, an optimistic hero that the audience could identify with. The addition of a pair of horn-rimmed glasses not only set the character apart from other comics of the era, but also gave him a more human identity that would become his trademark for the rest of his career. When I adopted the glasses, 
it uh, more or less put me in a different category because I became a human being. He was a kid that you would meet next door or across the street. But at the same time, I could still do all the, uh, the crazy things that we did before, but you believed them. They were natural, and your romance could be believable. In his films, he was often just a boy next door, a dreamer who strived to make it big in life and win the heart of a beautiful woman in the process. One of his most frequent leading ladies, Mildred Davis, would become his wife in 1923, a marriage that lasted until her death over 40 years later. As the boy, Lloyd achieved more success than ever before, and things were looking up for the young comic. Then, in 1919, while posing for a publicity photo, Lloyd accidentally lit a bomb he thought was a prop. The resulting explosion cost Lloyd his index finger and thumb on his right hand. He was confident it was the end of his career. Fortunately for Harold, and for us, he discovered a way to keep performing and mask his injury, in the form of a flesh-colored glove that included two false fingers that he would wear on camera. Even today, it's hardly noticeable on screen unless you're aware. And it makes his stunts all the more impressive, considering he performed most of them with only eight fingers. Though he excelled at short comedies, Lloyd went on to become one of the most prolific feature film comedians in the 20s, starring in 12 features to Chaplin's four. When he overshot material for a short called A Sailor Made Man in 1921, Lloyd accidentally became a feature film star. He was one of the first filmmakers to rely on preview screenings to shape his work. When the test audience laughed throughout the rough 40-minute cut of the film, Lloyd decided not to change a thing, and his first feature-length film was born. As was also the case with his next feature, Grandma's Boy, in 1922, which tested poorly as a dramatic short. So Hal Roach and Harold went back and shot new comedy scenes over a few months to pad out the story. The result, a five-reel comedy, was one of the highest-grossing movies of the 1920s. Praised by both Keaton and Chaplin, the movie combined both incredible sight gags with character development, a concept that would redefine the structure of silent film comedy. It's a testament to the working relationship between Howard Lloyd and Hal Roach that they both trusted each other to get the film done right. So Lloyd said goodbye to Shorts Forever, and made all of his films intentionally as features from then on. In his feature films, Lloyd's own ambition to be a dramatic actor often inspired the motivations of his characters, as Harold the character always yearned to be seen as heroic by society. In 1923, though, Lloyd developed an idea for a film that would change his career forever. Playwright George Abbott offers this simple advice on story structure. In the first act, get your hero up in a tree. In the second act, throw stones at him. And in the third act, get him down safely. In 1923, safety last. This is exemplified masterfully. In the film, Lloyd plays a sales clerk at a department store. who has recruited a friend, Bill, to scale the 12-story building to drum up business and win the approval of Harold's boss. The only problem is Bill gets detained by a police officer, so Harold must climb to the first floor, then switch places with Bill on the second. Only Bill gets held up on the second floor. Then the third. Then the fourth, and so on. All the while, every imaginable obstacle is thrown Harold's way. The idea for this story actually came to Lloyd when he witnessed something similar happen in his own life. Two or three hundred people or more 
And I inquired what was going on. He said, uh, the man's going to scale this building. And I said, really? So I stood around and uh, sure did. They came in, they had a ceremony, they introduced him, and he started climbing, and he got about three floors, and I couldn't stand it anymore. I, I knew, just knew he was going to be killed, so I walked on up the street. And I didn't want to leave. I, if anything happened, I was going to be there to see what it was all about. And so I went around the corner where I couldn't see him, and I, lots of people were up there too. And I said, where is he now? I said, oh, he's about the fifth floor. Really? And then I'd peek around, sure. He was, and uh, no ledges on him. He was climbing from window to window. And, of course, the crowd were absolutely thrilled. and It had such a, a reaction on this group of people and on myself that I said, well, now, if it can have that and you do it properly on the screen, it should have the same results. Most of the ideas for Lloyd's films came about that way. He and his gag men would take a simple premise and then film the story in chronological order, coming up with new gags and ideas as the filming progressed. Even unplanned incidents could be worked into the story this way. For instance, in 1928 Speedy, which ends in a death-defying trolley car chase sequence, the stunt driver accidentally hit this post mid-take. Lloyd had the film crew then film him being thrown from the car for use as a close-up shot, and the crash became part of the story. Lloyd became known for these types of thrilling climax set pieces that gave his characters a chance to prove themselves. like in The Freshman, where Lloyd plays a college newcomer, desperate to make a big impression on everyone he meets. He eventually becomes the water boy of the football team, and in the film's final act, he must take the field as the only replacement player available. Or in The Kid Brother, where Lloyd plays the feeble son of the town sheriff, who is called into action at the climax of the film. It was these stories involving the everyman becoming the hero that inspired audiences. In turn, Lloyd trusted and relied on the feedback of his audience to set his work apart. Such was the case when audiences began to embrace sound films. Lloyd, unlike some comedians of the era, fully embraced talkies, ending his silent career in 1928 with Speedy. But this time you just stand right here and don't you make a sound. I'll be as quiet as a mouse. Okay. Step over here, dear. I think we can see better. Your rose, signorita. Oh, gracias, senor. May I keep it? Keep it, please, would you? Do you think the event of sound actually changed uh, comedy? Oh, changed everything in the motion mm -hmm, picture industry, mm -hmm. and very much so comedy. It didn't necessarily do what a lot of them thought it, uh, it thought it killed the uh, silent... Uh, a comedy picture, well, that was not true. It, uh, it supplemented it. They, at first, they just had to get used to blending the two. Lloyd vowed to use sound not just to enhance his stories, but also as a way to tell new types of jokes. It also helped that his actual voice perfectly complemented his screen character. On your feet, any shoe would look lovely. Even a horseshoe. I beg your pardon. As the 30s went on, he continually perfected new sight gags that would inspire comedians for decades to come. Lloyd also used sound to enhance some of his older material. Oh, look out! Look. Yeah. Such as this sequence in Feet First, which was inspired by the end of Safety Last. Only Lloyd adds a lot of new gags here. Help me! Hey! Hey! After five varied yet successful sound features, 1938's Professor Beware, an archaeology-themed comedy, failed commercially and critically. This, along with growing studio interference, convinced Lloyd that it was time to retire from the screen. 
he spent his early retirement dabbling in photography and producing a couple of films. But eight years later, self-confessed Harold Lloyd fan, filmmaker Preston Sturgis, talked him out of retirement to star in a follow-up to his 1925 hit, The Freshman. The film's plot picks up where The Freshman left off, and then follows Harold 20 years after his triumph on the football field, having been recently fired and on a bender after sampling alcohol for the very first time. Lovely. Just like Velvet. What was that yelling? Did you hear something just then? <laughs> to innocence. Despite reinventing some of his earlier gags, Lloyd and Sturgis disagreed on the direction of the movie, which resulted in an uneven final product. It was released in 1947 as The Sin of Harold Diddlebach. The mixed reviews upon its release prompted producer Howard Hughes to recut the movie, believing that having Sin in the title affected its potential success. It was recut and renamed Mad Wednesday and released three years later, still receiving mixed critical reception. The experience left Lloyd with a permanent distaste for the new Hollywood system, and he retreated back into retirement. In 1962, he oversaw and produced a compilation of his earlier films titled Harold Lloyd's World of Comedy, containing footage that had not been seen publicly for decades. The type of picture we're doing, uh, world, uh, world of Comedy, will be a, a good introductory one because it'll show a certain gamut of the type of comedy that we did. This film helped renew interest in his career, with Lloyd often attending screenings of his work. While Lloyd's full ownership of his films allowed them never to be exploited or re-edited, it only hurt his legacy in the long run, as he rarely allowed them to play on television. He died in 1971 at the age of 77. It was only after his death that his work began to be seen all over the world through syndication. While Lloyd didn't live to see his work fully rediscovered, he always took great pride and joy when younger audiences responded to his movies. Today, close to a century after his first features were released, I think he'd be overjoyed to know his movies are continually rediscovered by new audiences all over the world. I always recommend that if someone's looking to get into silent film, they start with Harold Lloyd. You'll honestly forget you're watching a silent movie when viewing his work. He's just that good. A testament to the everyman in the horn-rimmed glasses and the genre he forever changed. <laughs>